We want to introduce you to a new study that we're doing. It's called Self-Directed Biological Transformation Initiative, short SBTI. Uh, it came about as a result of the findings uh, of Elizabeth Blackburn and uh, Alyssa here um, on the telomerase uh, increase by 40% in four days of meditation. And then we decided uh, that we want to extend this to a one-week program that we have here, which is a total immersion, really, into transforming your biology. And it takes into account, I now realize, the interaction between the microbiome and the human genome and uh, what's happening in your mind and your consciousness and epigenetics, it's all coming in a way together. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do is the, maybe you should start, Rudy, how it got initiated, and then maybe, Paul, you can say what the project is, and then Happy everyone to. can join. Murali, you haven't met yet. Uh, he's a professor of neuropsychiatry at Duke University. And, um, and of course, Eric, you heard, and Rudy heard, and Paul is now the director for research at the Chopra Foundation mm -hmm. and a professor at UCSD. Well, I'll, I'll, be, um, I'll be brief because I think we should spend most of the time hearing about these exciting data. You've got a preview of some of the data from the meditation study that really started here. We showed a little bit of the preview of it last year. Um, but basically, um, when we wrote Superbrain and we celebrated the gift of neuroplasticity, so when, based on your lifestyle, your choices, your perspective, your outlook, your attitude, um, your level of stress, you are changing your neural network. The neural network is dynamic. Uh, Deepak was telling the story about the men's room. The question he asked me, is the brain a noun or a verb? And, uh, I told them it's a verb. It's always in action. It's, it's a dynamic system that right now, during this course of this conference, you've reshaped and revised your neural network according to what you've learned. You're doing this every moment. So, you know, you're in charge of the world your brain brings you. Now, if you apply this to your genes, yes, you're born with certain genes that predispose you to certain traits or diseases. There's a a minor part of the genome that causes to have mutations that cause disease. But in most cases, again, your lifestyle, everything about what you do is affecting your gene activity, genes being turned up or down like a volume knob. And as genes can go up and down, some of these changes, and you, you know, there's an incredible network of changes, and you heard that from Eric's incredible work, uh, you're changing your entire system based on gene activities that are being influenced by the choices you're making in your life. And the fact that you can change gene activity and even do it permanently by chemically modifying those genes with your decisions, that's called epigenetics. So what neuroplasticity is to the brain, epigenetics is to the genome. Just like you can say, you know, my brain's not using me, I'm using my brain, I'm taking charge here. You can try to do the same thing with your genome thanks to epigenetics. It's not just the genes you're born with, it's how you use them and your lifestyle will be affecting changes up and down. So the goal was, can we find out, can we find lifestyle changes, meditation, diet, exercise, stress level, that will affect our genes in the right direction? Well, how do you know what the right direction is? Well, take people who are doing really good things here uh, for, for a week, uh, meditating, eating a good diet, um, relaxing, and saying, what happens at the genetic level? Let's call that a wellness profile, to use a term, and try to strive for that every single day, every person, every city. So that's the beginning of this basic um, pioneering effort to say what is the well-being gene expression profile? What do we want to see in the blood in terms of markers for inflammation, aging, like telomerase, all of that? And the pioneers of that, our, our astronauts, so to speak, who are going to be doing this are here, going to, going to be in this program this week generating the first data of these types to follow up on our successful pilot experiment, which, which was the meditation study. So you'll hear about the meditation study, you'll hear about the SBTI, Self-Directed Biological Transformation Initiative, um, in the following um, uh, talks. Thank you. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I've prepared a few slides about this new study, which uh, are they up? Great. 
which I'll just refer to for short as the SBTI project. I'm going to give you an overview of the design, which is in some ways a fairly standardized biomedical research design. And then my colleagues here will be going into some of the details of some of the assessments we'll be doing. So SBTI and well-being. When I was preparing this talk, I just did a little search on well-being, and these are the sort of images that invariably pop up. It's typically people out in nature, often this gesture, which I think is us um, having a sense of renewal and rejuvenation in the natural world. And this word well-being links well with this SBTI project because it's a research project that's embedded within a course here at the Chopra Center called Perfect Health. And Perfect Health is essentially an Ayurvedic immersion. And we just had a prior talk here about what Ayurveda is, a whole systems approach to well-being and renewal. So the Perfect Health program is offered here innumerable times during the year, several times a month. And these are some of the characteristics of this Perfect Health program. So there's lots of yoga, meditation, Ayurvedic massage, Ayurvedic herbs, uh, an Ayurvedic medical consultation to help you understand more the constitution of your own physiology of which then the treatments are matched to. As I said, the design we have put together for this project is in some ways standardized. We're going to have participants. They'll be randomized, for the most part, into either the perfect health course to take place here at the Chopra Center or a control group, which will essentially be folks who also come to La Costa and have a week, essentially a resort week, which will also presumably improve their well-being, but we're hypothesizing not nearly as much as the perfect health course itself. So in some ways, the, the research study is traditional, but I want to now share with you two, two aspects of the study that are really unique. And uh, Deepak and Rudy already referred to this, that number one, this is a multi-institutional project. I've been doing clinical research for over 20 years. I've done a number of studies where we've had two, maybe three, maybe four institutions, but this is a compilation of eight institutions, which I have them listed here. I won't read them all out, although uh, my home institution is the University of California, San Diego. It's the one on, my, on the lower left. I'm looking at it. It looks like I made that image a little larger than the others, maybe unconsciously. I noticed that. <laughs> Noticing that, yes. Um, the beauty of this uh, inter-institutional collaboration is that we have expertise of all these scholars, scientists, and clinician scientists. And I'm going to show you on this slide all the things that we're going to measure. And the slide's going to fill up with lots of images. I don't have time to go into the rationale of each one, but uh, some of the subsequent presentations now will get into that a little bit more. So we're going to be taking blood samples to look at DNA, RNA, and protein expression. Heart rate variability, uh, this was presented our, earlier with Stephen Stobel at Scripps, and we'll be assessing some of the autonomic nervous system, uh, which is a very important indicator of wellness of the, uh, of, of the nervous system itself. We're going to be assessing the microbiome, both in the gut and also in skin. And this uh, is a very interesting hot area in medicine these days, which um, we will be speaking about in a few minutes. We're going to look at cortisol that we can obtain in saliva that it gives us insight into the functioning of the autonomic nervous system, particularly the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and also the sympathetic nervous system. We're going to be measuring proteases in the peripheral circulation, and we're doing this because there's this whole hypothesis I imagine some of you have read about. It's called the leaky gut hypothesis, and the theory is that much of the stress that we're under, as well as a typical American diet, causes the gut to leak out a lot of the digestive enzymes into the peripheral circulation. And in the peripheral circulation, they wreak havoc, including, for example, they begin to digest insulin receptors. And once those receptors are digested, then we can move ourselves into areas such as type 2 diabetes. 
course, we're going to be measuring states of mind, wellness, mindfulness, mood, gratitude, spirituality. I have a few of them listed there, as well as some other things. Inflammatory biomarkers such as CRP, which are indicators of cardiovascular disease and stress. And finally, uh, something that uh, Dr. Alyssa Eppel will speak about, we'll be measuring telomerase, which is uh, these days considered a good marker of aging and overall stability of the physiology. Here's the general design. As most studies, we're going to measure people prior to coming here and beginning the, the, uh, the course, and then once they arrive, at the end of the seven days, and then we're going to do a follow-up assessment, which is number four. There are some people here in the audience who are already enrolled and will be participating in the very first cohort of this study, which launches this Monday. And those who are in the cohort already, approximately two weeks ago, we mailed them two boxes that had a variety of things in there that they began to take samples from themselves and also gather some physiology measurement. And then they mailed those things back to our laboratories. When we begin the project Monday, we'll be repeating a lot of those same assessments that you see on the screen, and we'll also be taking blood and skin samples. Then at the end of the seven days, we're going to repeat that, more blood, more skin samples, and then a month later when they return home, we're going to get the whole batch of assessments again. So we're generating a lot of data. We'll really be able to get a sense of understanding what does this system of Ayurvedic wellness do to multiple levels of the physiology. There's one other area that's unique about this project I want to share with you. Those of you who are doing research, all of you here would recognize this website, pubmed.gov. It's essentially a treasure trove of all the biomedical publications that exist. Um, and currently, there are 25 million scientific papers within this website. And you can go to it, and you can search any topic, and the papers will come up. Ayurveda, whole systems medicine. So what if I go to this website and I search how many studies have there been done on meditation? And here's what I found. I just did this two days ago. 3,500 studies on meditation, a component of Ayurveda, as well as other wellness systems. How many studies on yoga? 2,800. How many, looking at herbs alone, over 4,000. How many, looking at massage, 8,000. So these are all separate components of systems such as Ayurveda. How many studies are published that combine all these simultaneously, which is the point of these whole systems? The concept that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Does anybody want to guess how many publications there are where researchers have looked at all these things simultaneously? <laughs> That's exactly right. Zero. And I'm pretty confident in that because I've been using PubMed for many years. I know how to do the searches, and there was zero. I will confess there was one trial that looked at three of the four portions of Ayurveda. It was a type 2 diabetes project. But none have looked at this comprehensively, and we'll be the first ones to do that with a huge range of uh, measurements. Outcomes, lots of things. We'll be writing up and publishing our findings in the journals. But also, more broadly, we envision beginning to transform, really, how medicine is practiced, bringing in these traditional whole systems, as well as trying to help uh, guide and integrate, uh, let's say, further revitalize the field of integrative medicine as it's now understood and, and developing. OK, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Great. Hi, I'm Alyssa Eppel. And I, um, many of you last year may have heard me talk about our preliminary results from our SOS, Seduction of Spirit Meditation Study here. So you have to hear me again. But um, last year, I kept, before every single finding, said this is preliminary, and I was tense, and I said no tweets, and we didn't believe our own findings. So now we're done, and we have confidence, and we have new findings. Mm. So let me tell you what we found. Now, first of all, I just want to mention how remarkable it is that Deepak opened up 
the whole Chopra Center and retreat to be studied. Whether we found positive results, neutral or negative, you know, he's completely open, partly maybe because he doesn't believe in the, you know, narrow linear causal model anyway, but um, it's been really incredible to be able to do such a controlled study um, in a center like this. And part of the problem with studying meditation is the people who go to these retreats, like many of you, are already experts. You probably have different neural pathways and ways of responding to stress. And in fact, um, we did study some of the experts, and, and we did find they're quite different. They walk in with more positive affect. They um, uh, score higher on spirituality. They actually have suffered more. They had more early trauma and early life adversity, which may well be why they found mm. meditation in mm. the first place. So we needed to do a well-controlled study, and one of the big challenges is to really separate out the relaxation effect. We heard about the... Um, the uh, rest and digest effect um, from Steve Steinbull. It's a huge effect. Relaxation changes, changes almost everything in our body. So we needed to strip away that and see beyond the relaxation effect, what does meditation do to our mind, to our physiology? Mm. Now, Lacoste is a perfect venue because it is a retreat center within a resort. So we get to bring people in to the same moment in time, same week, same environment, half of them relax at the pool, and the other half go into this pretty amazing, intensive, week-long retreat where they're learning yoga, meditation, and diet's part of it, but both of our groups changed their diet. They were both eating a very pure, healthy Ayurvedic diet. So that was controlled. The difference was how they spent their minutes in this environment. So we advertised in California, um, San Diego. We had many, many more willing volunteers than we could take when they saw the ad, free week at La Costa. Um, many people didn't believe it. But we got people who have never meditated, novices. And they agreed to be randomized and to stay here, whether they got the, the retreat or the, the leisure week. So then we measured. Uh, blood before and after. We measured their well-being, depression, stress, vitality before and after. And what did we find in terms of well-being? So you can make your own guess in your head. We all have our own ideas about who might have thrived more. And what I can tell you is based on all of our standard measures at the end of the week, there were tremendous changes, 60% reduction in stress and depression and dr dramatic increases in vitality in all groups. So Omni Lacosta probably likes this effect. We found a relaxate, a vacation effect that everyone had, and there was no difference between groups in these kind of crude self-report measures. When we looked closer at the day, we looked at how they responded to stress. The novice meditators went from, well, everyone had the same stressors, same severity of stressors, but the novice meditators were viewing them as as less of a threat to themselves. They felt more control of their daily stressors. So that was one difference that, that um, reached, you know, was, was a big enough effect that um, was significant. So, but really short-term change isn't where the money is. What, what about the, the endurance test of well-being? What really matters, we go on vacation, we feel great. What about a month later? Are you left with a residue? of this vacation effect. So we, we looked at a month and even 10 months later. Now who do you think the winners were? Hmm. We found very large reductions in depression only for the novices. The people who learned meditation for the first time went home and sustained this dramatic increase in well-being. So partly probably changes in schemas and viewing daily stressors. And a big part of it was the hard work of daily practice. So we did measure practice. Those who were um, integrating the daily meditation did show stronger sustained reductions in stress and depression. And so there was a tremendous uh, big adherence effect that I wish we could get in our studies um, of behavior change. So um, it's... It wasn't magical, it was, really the, it was really the daily work, and that's a theme that will come up again. Now, what about the biology? What happened during that week? Now, there the story is different. We saw dramatic improvements in both biomarkers and gene expression patterns 
but only in the experts. So the experts came with a different set of experience and well-being, and they built on that in, in a significant way. So you, saw, you might have seen page one of our brochure where the, the telomerase finding was reported. We saw a boost of 40% uh, increase in telomerase activity. So what, right? We think that that is significant, and we're doing longitudinal studies to now to test that. But this boost in telomerase, if it, it's sustained, it's maintaining telomeres and genomic stability and preventing cellular tissue aging. And Dean Ornish did a small study showing that his intensive intervention boosted telomerase after four months. And then he went, went back in f five years later and measured the telomeres. And the telomeres of the intervention group were lengthened compared to the control group. So that was a promising hint that these shorter term boosts of telomerase might be meaningful, particularly if they're sustained. There was another biological system we measured. You heard about this yesterday, and that is the amazing web of complex gene expression changes. And Eric, I'm going to let Eric put this finding in context, but I'll tell you that um, we found that we were able to see very strong patterns, changes in gene expression from the beginning to the end, that these patterns, not surprisingly, were suppression in our stress response and wound tingle response, people were able to turn that machinery off during this relaxing week. But the meditation group, the experts, had a novel gene expression network that was related to um, different biological factors that we think reflect better aging and better um, protein folding and, and cellular processes that we think are important in longevity. So we're, we're still exploring that, and Eric will talk more about that. So I, I did have... Um, some friends who, some colleagues who happen to be in the retreat that I, that I see around, and, and they do still maintain this um, daily meditation. And I think, you know, why wasn't I in their seat? Why was I on the researcher side for that study, that particular study? So I'm coming back um, for, the, for that retreat for myself. But anyway, so the bottom line here is that uh, meditation every day may improve the function of our DNA. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric, who can explain what we, um, what we, next steps for how we really understand these gene expression findings. Thanks. Yeah. So as Alyssa said, there was uh, really uh, almost a surprising, dramatic effect on the gene expression pre and post, uh, what I refer to as the treatment, and uh, you know it wasn't. Uh, you know, 10 genes or 50 genes or 100 genes, it was a 1,000 plus genes, so very, very significant mm -hmm. shift in the molecular states that exist in, in the blood-derived uh, cells. And the most interesting thing is these changes, as Alyssa was uh, alluding to, weren't random. You know, when we look at the interconnectivity of the genes and what processes are they involved in and what diseases or wellness do they predispose you to, uh, they were very, very coherent, very interrelated in affecting very, you know, significant biological processes that we've associated with many different diseases from, you know, from Alzheimer's to IBD to rheumatoid arthritis and, and uh, viral infection. So all of these processes being affected in a, in a very coherent manner. And the aim in both this existing study and the coming study will be can we resolve some of the causal links uh, in these different networks and actually understand, you know, what are the, the basically the main drivers that are responding to uh, what you're going through when you're either meditating or you're, a lot of other things are happening, the types of oils and uh, other things that you might have rubbed on you or consume, you know, what are those, what are the key drivers that are responsible for the responses that we see in the networks and can we actually start stratifying individuals who, who responds you know, best to that sort of uh, uh, treatment versus versus uh, those who maybe don't respond as well. You know, we can actually come up with biomarkers for that for that kind of thing. And of course, then we can map those particular signatures, kind of what I talked about yesterday, to all the different natural products, drugs, and exercise and diet induced signatures uh, to see how you know we might make those matches. One of the pretty most interesting things, how I actually got connected to Rudy and to Deepak, 
was in looking at some of this meditation data and comparing it to what we see in clinical trials with the placebo arm of the trials. Uh, we started looking at responders in the placebo arm of the trials, right? So they, you know, they're taking a placebo, so they shouldn't have any effect. But as we know in the clinical trial space, those on placebo can have a very profound effect. So we looked at the molecular states between those who were responding to the placebo versus those who were not responding to placebo and did the same sort of experiment that Alyssa just uh, uh, described and saw changes in those molecular networks that were very similar to the types of changes we're seeing in meditation. So I think very, very exciting just uh, to start understanding how that sort of connectivity can drive these molecular changes and induce, you know, uh, better physiological mm -hmm. states. Good afternoon and uh, namaste. Thank you, Deepak, for inviting me. It's an honor. Uh, one of the uh, three main aims of this study is looking at mental well-being measures, and more importantly, how mental well-being measures are interlinked with each one of those systems biology measures, whether it be genetics, uh, whether it be physiological sensor data, or whether it be uh, microbiome data, or there is a new technique that has not been mentioned, which is called metabolomics, which is the measurement of how the various metabolites in the body interact with each other. So with this technique, with a single drop of blood, for example, you can measure 800 different lipid fractions, uh, not just the three that you normally measure in your doctor's office, HDL, LDL, and total cholesterol. And studies have shown that many of these fractions are altered by stress, many of them are altered by uh, overeating, by exercise, both in good and in bad ways. So this will give us a very comprehensive snapshot of uh, what's happening in people in relation to stress, in relation to lifestyle changes, et cetera. So I'm going to, I think everybody in this audience really knows the importance of mental health. Really, there is no health without mental health. I think everybody agrees with that. And I think everybody is also aware from the last few talks that we haven't really made a huge dent in terms of rates of many, many different mental illnesses. I think many of the new exciting research projects are going to give us answers as to how to better diagnose these illnesses, perhaps better classify them and come up with new treatments. But right now, for example, if you just take suicide, as we were reminded by the tragic loss of one of our beloved actors, uh, suicide rates, we really haven't made a big dent over the last perhaps 50 years to 70 years. In fact, amongst middle-aged Americans, suicide rates are rising, perhaps due to stress, perhaps economic stress, uh, lack of social support, the way sort of uh, we are structuring our lives, uh, et cetera. So that's one. Rates of conditions such as childhood bipolar disorder, ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder, they are rising. In fact, the military has lost more men to suicide than to combat. So what we now know is that stress, depression, anxiety, insomnia affect virtually every tissue, virtually every system in our body. And if you happen to be unfortunate enough to have a medical illness along with depression, then the outcome for that medical illness is two or three times worse if you happen to have a clinical uh, depression or a clinical anxiety disorder uh, or an addiction or other kinds of problems. So it's almost like a, uh, a, a double sort of hit uh, to your system. And the reverse is also true. If you're able to treat the depression or anxiety or build resilience to these, uh, then the outcomes of your comorbid medical conditions are far better, and you may also prevent developing some medical conditions. Okay. So I'm gonna to illustrate to you a study that uh, Aetna, which is a large health insurance company, did along with Duke and a few other uh, institutions. It was a pilot study that was done two years ago that is a perfect, perfect study as to why this study uh, is going to be so important. So 250 Aetna employees with relatively high stress levels were randomized into three groups. One group got mindful meditation and yoga in a live classroom setting. In a group setting, they were coming much like what's going to be done here. The second group got it online through virtual instructors because the goal was to see can you, if you need to scale it up, can you even do this online? Is online as good as a real yogi teaching a class? And the third was a control group, which was doing uh, more sort of relaxation type exercises. 
And what they found was that after 12 weeks, both the, uh, the live meditation group as well as the online virtual meditation group experienced about a 40% decrease in stress compared to the control group. And an annual cost savings of healthcare costs was about $2,000. So Aetna has now made this program available to every Aetna uh, employee in the company. So that's an example of how a great study with a result like this could be scaled on a large scale. And this is the next step. The Aetna study did not measure any biological measures, did not really try to understand the effects of meditation or yoga on the body. And I think this step, this study is the next logical step in trying to understand how all of these different systems work together. So I want to thank you. So that was excellent. I just want to add a couple of things, uh, just to emphasize a couple of things. Uh, you heard about the microbiome. So 90% of our gene material, the DNA in our body, 90% of it is microbial even though the gene mass of the microbe is only maybe 3% of our total body mass, the gene, the gene expression, 90% is microbiome. It's in our skin, it's in our hair follicles, it's in our, um, uh, all our orifices, it's in our gut, it's in our stomach, it's in our intestine, intestines. And about 25 to 30% of the molecules that are circulating in your blood come from this microbiome. Mm -hmm. And more and more information right now that the, there's crosstalk between the human DNA and the microbial DNA. The microbial DNA spans all of evolution, literally. So you know, your, our bodies are ecosystems that uh, have the history of evolution in them. Why this study is even more important than I think we could emphasize is part of the Ayurvedic treatments include ingesting oils, combinations of oils before they start during the program. And these oils, now it turns out, you know, the, we're talking about Mediterranean diet, olive oil, but the oils that we use are a combination of primrose oil, olive oil, sesame oil, flaxseed oil, and they start that before they come and we're taking the microbiome before they do that. Mm -hmm. So the oils are an important component. And then the herbs, you know, there are about seven herbs that are used. And I, when you start to look at these herbs, they're what uh, science is identifying today as adaptogens. So they modulate the effects of stress or cortisol at a cellular level, some research. But now, with our being able to look at the microbiome, look at the crosstalk between the microbiome and the human genome, and the fact that we're combining all these things, including diet. Even though the controls will get Ayurvedic diet, but you know the fact is our, uh, the people who are studying, being studied are taking a plant fiber as well, which the controls won't be getting. So the diet itself alters the microbiome too. And we'll have this little bit of difference between the controls and the ones who are going through us. So it's truly a systems biology, holistic approach. Now, does anyone want to make any comments? Because I just have to share a short story uh, before the conclusion. You know, I'm, I've been interested in this for now 30 years, and we've heard a lot about stress and <laughs> stress management, and I just, I don't know, Bob Thurman walked away just now, but if you look at the traditions of meditation, it wasn't about stress. So my teacher, my guru, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, was also known as the guru of the Beatles, unfortunately. Maharishi, when he first came to this country, you know, we had some of these conferences about stress, and one day he called me aside and he whispered, whispered in my ear, he said, what is this stress? <laughs> so, I tried to explain to him. <laughs> I said, people are calming down, they're sleeping better. He said, but meditation is not about sleeping better, it's about waking up. <laughs> it's about waking up to your true self, which is consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my obsession with all this has been since then. So in 19, 
88, I wrote a book called Quantum Healing, which I think Alyssa has read. And I postulated in that book, and it was, of course, criticized by mainstream medicine, although it got a good review in the New England Journal of Medicine, short one. Um, uh, I wrote the book Quantum Healing, basically saying that if you restored your body into its original state of pure consciousness, then homeostasis would occur. And that would be called, the healing system is basically what's restoring homeostasis. The book became a national bestseller, uh, despite being vilified by a lot of the mainstream. But one of the outcomes of that um, book was I got a call from an old friend of mine, George Harrison of the Beatles. And he came and we spent a week together and he wrote a song. And I'd like to close this, this with George Harrison's original song. Based, the lyrics are from the book and it talks about consciousness being inside of you and also everywhere. Only the Beatles could have written stuff like this. So I want you to hear this song. And the lyrics are there. And he signed, of course, the lyrics to Deepak, my first quantum mechanical song, John. <laughs> On the street of villains, take him for a ride. You can have the devil as a guide. Crippled by the boundaries, programmed into guilt Till your nervous system starts to tilt In the room of mirrors, you can see for miles But everything that's there is in disguise Every word you've uttered, and every thought you've had all inside you find the good and the bad But in the rising sun You can feel your life begin Universe at play Inside your DNA And you're a billion years old today I have been employed Working there till I was near destroyed I was almost a statistic Inside a doctor's case When I heard the messenger from inner space He was sending me a signal That for so long I had ignored but he held on to my biblical call Until a ghost of memory Trapped in my body and mind Came out of hiding to become alive
played out the song. So, um, that song uh, was just, I had that song with me all these years. It was unpublished. And then after he passed away, I gave it to Olivia, his wife. Just got mm -hmm. published. The universe at play inside your DNA. You're a billion years old today from the Beatles. Microbiome and the human genome and uh, what's happening in your mind and your consciousness and epigenetics, it's all coming in a way together. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do is the maybe you should start, Rudy, how it got initiated, and then maybe, Paul, you can say what the project is, and then Happy everyone to. can join. Murali, you haven't met yet. Uh, he's a professor of neuropsychiatry at Duke University, and, um, and of course, Eric, you heard, and Rudy heard, and Paul is now the director for research at the Chopra Foundation, mm -hmm. and a professor at UCSD. Well, I'll, I'll, be, um, I'll be brief because I think we should spend most of the time hearing about these exciting days. You know, you're in charge of the world your brain brings you. Now, if you apply this to your genes, yes, you're born with certain genes that predispose you to certain traits or diseases. There's a, a minor part of the genome that causes, to have mutations that cause disease. But in most cases, again, your lifestyle, everything about what you do is affecting your gene activity, genes being turned up or down like a volume knob. And as genes can go up and down, some of these changes, and you, you know, there's an incredible network of changes, and you heard that from Eric's incredible work, uh, you're changing your entire system based on gene activities that are being influenced by the choices you're making in your life. And the fact that you can change gene activity and even do it permanently by chemically modifying those genes with your decisions, that's called epi- We want to introduce you to a new study that we're doing. It's called Self-Directed Biological Transformation Initiative, short SBTI. Uh, it came about as a result of the findings uh, of Elizabeth Blackburn and uh, Alyssa here um, on the telomerase uh, increase by 40% in four days of meditation. And then we decided uh, that we want to extend this to a one-week program that we have here, which is a total immersion, really, into transforming your biology. And it takes into account, I now realize, the interaction between the microgenetics. So what neuroplasticity is to the brain, epigenetics is to the genome. Just like you can say, you know, my brain's not using me, I'm using my brain, I'm taking charge here. You can try to do the same thing with your genome thanks to epigenetics. It's not just the genes you're born with, it's how you use them, and your lifestyle will be affecting changes up and down. So the goal was, can we find out, can we find lifestyle changes, meditation, diet, exercise, stress level, that will affect our genes in the right direction. Well, how do you know what the right direction is? Well, take people who are doing really good things here uh, for, for a week, uh, meditating, eating a good diet, um, relaxing, and saying, what happens at the genetic level? Let's call that a wellness profile, to use a term. You got a preview of some of the data from the meditation study that really started here. We showed a little bit of the preview of it last year, um, but basically, um, when we wrote Superbrain and we celebrated the gift of neuroplasticity. So when, based on your lifestyle, your choices, your perspective, your outlook, your attitude, um, your level of stress, you are changing your neural network. The neural network is dynamic. Uh, Deepak was telling the story about the men's room. The question he asked me, is the brain a noun or a verb? And, uh, I told them it's a verb. It's always in action. It's, it's a dynamic system that right now, during this course of this conference, you've reshaped and revised your neural network according to what you've learned. You're doing this every moment. So 